Welcome to Trash Talk MMA, the number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado, Antoine Peltier. Yo, welcome to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Peltier. And on today's episode, I have a very special guest, Mr. Sam Bastin, fitness instructor at Tiger Muay Thai. Sam, how you doing? Yeah, good. I'm um, glad to be here. And uh, I've never done one of these podcasts before, so it's uh, something interesting and new for me. As Antoine said, uh, I'm a fitness instructor at Tiger Muay Thai. I'm also a professional MMA fighter from Australia, uh, Australia, Port Macquarie, New South Wales. I've been here now in Thailand for a year, uh, just under a year, sorry, about you know, 10, 11 months. And um, I moved everything I have from home to here to better myself with my MMA career and also uh, with my job now at Tiger Muay Thai as a fitness coach. Great. So listen, before we get into what you're doing currently at Tiger Muay Thai, I'd like to just get into your background. You said you're a professional MMA fighter. What got you into martial arts and at what age? Uh, I started uh, martial arts at a very young age. I first uh, found Kung Fu when I was about six, seven years old. Uh, My parents got me into that as I was actually getting bullied at school. So it kind of went a funny way. Uh, Once I started learning how to defend myself and um, sticking up for myself, you know, a couple of years in from learning Kung Fu towards then towards boxing. Uh, and I started actually competing at an amateur level when I was 14 years old sure. uh, okay. with boxing. Um, yeah. I've now been doing that for a, a number of years as well, taking away a couple of state titles and regional titles and things like that. So you started your career in combat sports in boxing with amateur boxing? Yes, with amateur okay. boxing, 14 right. years old, yeah. So from there, uh, what, what, where did you go after the boxing? What was the next martial art that you... Yeah, um, as soon as I uh, finished high school, I actually moved away to it, Port Macquarie. And uh, that's where I found uh, another, another local gym there, um, which, which uh, taught MMA and other combat sports as well. So I, I uh, pretty much got into that straight away, the MMA, the MMA scene. And then four weeks in, I had my very first amateur MMA fight. Yeah. Shit, okay. Yeah, so. Now, were you always a UFC fan? Like, what was your exposure to mixed martial arts? Um, exposure to mixed martial arts, I, I watched some local shows, some local Australian shows, CFC, um, Brace, things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, these shows have been around for a while, and uh, some some guys interested me on there, like uh, Jai Bradney, to name one of them, uh, Jason Harris, my, my uh, previous trainer. Um, so I had, you know, some some prior knowledge to MMA, but had never pursued anything serious until I actually moved to Port Macquarie where I first began MMA. Yeah. So that was at what age, the MMA? 18. I had my first amateur fight when I was 18 years old. And how old are you now? I'm um, 23 now, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how many fights have you had? Um, I've had 30 fights altogether, 19, uh, 18 amateur, uh, amateur boxing, one amateur MMA and uh, 12 professional MMA. All right. Yeah. Shit. I mean, 12 fights is already pretty good. Yeah. It's not too bad. <laughs> For 23. <laughs> yeah. Okay. How, how did you fare? What's the record at? Yeah, I'm six and six as a pro. Okay. Um, I hold uh, an Australian title, Combat 8, uh, which I took out with my last fight. I dropped uh, dropped a featherweight for the first time in my career. Okay. Uh, I dropped from 84 kilos down to 66 kilos, which is a, a very, very big drop for, for anyone to handle. Um, but now that's my new, that's my new weight class at featherweight, um, which I prefer, but again, yeah, six and six as a pro, but always looking to, to get into fights. Uh, I haven't, I haven't competed in, in a year and a half has had a bit of a layoff due to some injuries and things like that. But what were the injuries? Uh, I broke my, my hand three times in 2013 and once in 2014. All during fights? Uh, twice during fights. Yeah. And twice during sparring. What were you throwing? Uh, left jab, left hook. Yeah. Shit, so you broke your hand on a jab. Yes, Damn. in a fight. <laughs> that must be a good jab. <laughs> That's crazy, man. So obviously, you're now here in Thailand. You're, you're, you're a trainer at Tiger Muay Thai. What, uh, what, how did the decision come about for you to leave Australia and to, and to come out here? You know, I wanted some, uh, some new changes. I kind of was in a position back home where I thought I needed to make a, a change. Otherwise, I was just going to continue on the same path I was, I was at. And that was not really getting the exposure that I, I could have potentially had. So that's why I chose to come to Tiger Muay Thai. 
Um, I've seen their advertisements all, all, all across Facebook, all across the internet. and Well, and there's so many Australians yeah. here. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. crazy. You know? For anybody who's never been out here, I mean, you come out to Phuket and there's there's Australians and Russians. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting to see that. Uh, see, I don't think that there's such a big exposure. For example, you know, I'm from Canada and I spent the last, uh, well, the last year traveling. But before that, I spent six years in Los Angeles and I'd never really heard of Tiger Muay Thai. You know, yeah, yeah, that's and uh, I'm sure they probably want to change that. And uh, I think now the fact that you're actually getting Tiger Muay Thai fighters in the UFC, that's going to bring a lot of exposure to what's already going on here, which is basically one of, if not the biggest training camp for martial arts in Thailand, with a majority of the people coming to train being foreigners. Yeah, that's correct. And uh, as you said, like the as of lately, the, there's an, a number of. Um, guys that are training out of Tiger Muay Thai that are competing in the UFC. And on top of that as well, we have guys like, uh, we, we had guys like George St. Pierre, um, Pat Cote, those type of guys that have been coming from, from Canada, you know, all around the world. Yeah, um, I was here last year when, uh, when Cote was training. Yeah, yeah. Dude, his dude was hitting hard. <laughs> it was funny. You could sit out there, you know, or you have, just have a smoothie and he was hitting the pads and it was, it was making a lot of noise. Yeah, he's a nice guy. Interesting dude. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of celebrity fighters that actually come through this camp. Yeah, yeah. Who have you Who have you had the, the pleasure of seeing come through? Here? Um, just recently, there's there's been a couple of guys that come through. Uh, Surreal Diabati was here yep. just doing a seminar probably about a month ago now. Because he's retired, right? Yeah, he's okay. retired now. But I mean, that's every dope. that's dope. So he was doing a seminar. Yeah, yeah he just done a seminar here. Um, that's cool. I like Diabati. Yeah, it's too bad. I think. I think he never found his stride. He, he had some good fights in Pride. He had some good fights in the UFC, and he just he just couldn't put it all together. You know, it's interesting. There's 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 some interesting French fighters that seem to struggle with advancing past that sort of B B plus level. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think Czech Congo is stuck in that. Uh, Carl Amasu. Do you know Carl Amasu? No, no. He's a really really interesting fighter in um, in Bellator. Yeah. Very explosive. You know, a lot of those guys, they, they go for the kill. And Diabati was the same. You know, he never put on a boring fight. But, uh, you know, you kind of live by the sword, die by the sword type <laughs> type guys, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So Diabati, uh, Eddie Bravo was out here? Yeah, Eddie Bravo was here about two months ago now. Um, really awesome seminar. I actually attended that seminar. It was a fantastic seminar, all about the rubber guard. And yeah. um, that's, what, that's his go-to move, as he says. And I think we had about... 50 to 60 people here for the seminar um, and it was only meant to go for about two hours but it ended up running for about four and a half hours so he spent a lot of time here helping a lot of guys out and um, I think a lot of people took away that's cool uh, a, a fair a fair vast of knowledge you know for that uh, for that what he what he came here to do so when these guys come to Tiger Muay Thai like Eddie Bravo or, or Diabati to give a seminar is this available to anybody who's staying in the facility at the time who's training at the this facility this is available or? to anyone at all that's you just really, walking off the street if you yeah. pay to be there you can if be you, there yeah. if you're staying somewhere on the street like there's a couple other gyms around here if you're staying anywhere yeah. and uh, obviously if you're staying on the on the street just for a holiday even and you can you can attend these uh, seminars at any any stage you can just you know usually there are a thousand or 2,000 baht, which is, what's the 2,000 baht? It's about 50 US. Something it's not like that, that much yeah. to attend yeah, exactly. one of these seminars. Yeah, so th- that's another interesting thing about, about this place is that it's a it's a big open <coughs> outdoor gym in, in Phuket, Thailand, pretty much in the middle of a jungle that's slowly being chopped down. We can talk about that. <laughs> I'm sure Will's going to want to talk about that. Will Elliott, who's the... Uh, the director of Tiger Muay Thai, I'm going to do a podcast with him very shortly as well. And he's he's been around for numerous years here and has, a, I think, a pretty interesting discourse about the evolution of this road. This road is called a Soi Taied, and uh, it's basically a, st- a strip of, I don't know how long is it, half a mile? I mean, yeah. yeah. Half a mile or so, and just littered with various uh, martial arts training facilities and fitness facilities. So that's another, another thing we can touch on right now. You're an MMA fighter. You haven't fought in a while due to injuries. And you're now training as a fitness instructor. So one thing that's interesting about Tiger Muay Thai is you don't just have to come here to train martial arts. A lot of people like to come here and just train fitness. That's correct. And it's it's interesting in that on sort of one side of uh, the facility, you have these old school Muay Thai trainers, many of them champions who've had hundreds of fights, uh, training people in the very you know methodical and traditional way of uh, of Muay Thai. And then on the other side of the facility, you have a lot of, I guess you could say, more modern and, and Western 
fitness practices. That's correct. Yeah. What's what's your take on that? Um, do you find that some people like to just do one or the other, or are people trying to take advantage of kind of both schools of thought? Yeah, I think with uh, well, what we offer at Tiger obviously um, is all of these options. You know, so there's you can choose to do Muay Thai, you can choose to do the MMA classes, you can choose to do the fitness classes. The vast of classes that are offered there can anyone can choose to do anything at any time, um, and obviously with having. Uh, coaches, John, John Priest is the head coach for the, uh, fitness department. There's myself, there's Andrew Wood, there's Ocean Bloom. We have the four, the four instructors of us at the moment. Um, obviously with the experience that we all have, um, I mean, Ocean, Ocean Bloom and, and John Priest have been t- teaching fitness and been involved with fitness scene for almost 20 years, yep, uh, yep. per, per, for, for both of them, you know, so. Um, I'm only qu- quite new to the fitness scene. I've been doing this for about six years now. So for me, um, being involved with such, such high level, um, high talent, level, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm learning every day as an instructor as well. So yeah, we'll be getting John on the show probably tomorrow. Um, and I have a, a really you know really cool story about my experience with John. I, I trained with him exclusively for ten weeks last year to get in the best shape of my life, and uh, it was really a life altering experience. So yeah, I mean, there's 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 world class, you know, fitness talent and martial arts training. Uh, you know, there's there's James McSweeney training striking. Um, there's Roger Huerta training. He, I guess he's the, the head MMA coach. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you know, uh, Brian Ebersole was out here for a while, and he'll be. You know, he's he's always a a big uh, evangelist and ambassador for Tiger Muay Thai as well. So just a lot of familiar faces, a lot of celebrity faces. It's a cool experience to be able to just walk into a place, get in great shape learn some Muay Thai, learn some self-defense, learn some MMA. And guess what? I mean, at the same time, it's kind of uh, it's kind of like being in LA where you don't know who's going to come in. And, uh, you know, if you're a fan of the sports, such as myself, it's it's a pleasure being able to meet these people in this experience where everybody's just uh, at the same level. Everybody's there to train, get healthy and have a good time. And that's it. And you, you meet so many amazing people uh, at this location. You know, you meet so many people from all across the world, with countries that I've never heard of before. And these people are here and they've got this similar mindset and everyone's here for, for a goal to reach, whether it's to do with combat sports or whether it's to do with losing weight. Everyone here has a similar goal and everyone has a similar mindset, which, you know, creates a really good atmosphere and, um, they, they welcome anyone here and that's the best thing. They welcome anyone along here and we're here to help people get there and achieve their goals. So as a fitness instructor yourself, do you have any particular qualifications? I mean, what, what brought you into this role? Did you just learn on the fly as by being a fighter or did you do some, some do you have some education in that regard? Yeah, yeah. I've got, um, obviously pretty ed- educated. Um, as soon as I, uh, finished h- high school, I went and got my degrees in, uh, in personal training and fitness instructing. I then, uh, at, at Port Macquarie, I then, uh, started working there at Port Macquarie and had been there for five years, t- taking all forms of classes, from fitness classes to striking classes, absolutely everything, teaching everything in the gym, managing the gym. The, uh, this gym was, uh, CrossFit ACSE, which is now, uh, it's now closed now. It's not actually around anymore. But, uh, you know, I learned everything, uh, through there and I then, uh, once I moved to Thailand, I, I was only originally here for training and I kind of fell into the role of teaching within the first two weeks that I was here. Excellent. Fell into a role of helping out. So did you um, come here as a tourist? Yeah, I came here to you train. Just, you know, I yeah, just came you, here to have Okay, you just came here to train. Okay, yeah. exactly what I did. Yeah. So how did this opportunity for you to actually become employed through Tiger MT come about? Well, uh, I was here and when I, when I, when I originally came over... Who was working here at that stage? I'm just trying to remember who was working here. What was it, a year ago? Because, I mean, I was out yeah, here. I was literally out here a year ago. I came out February, Valentine's Day last year, and pretty much got here Valentine's Day this year. This was, uh, yeah, roughly about 11, 12, 11, 12 months ago now. Yep. So just just under a year. Um, so, I mean, John wasn't there. John wasn't here. Um, He's only been here for six months now. So there was a couple of other instructors. Um, Jenna... Uh, so I mean, Aurora was Aurora was teaching there. at that stage, yeah. There was a the female, black dude with an afro. Yeah, and the female MMA fighter. I'm trying to remember her name. She's from Australia. She fought. Yes, a, yes. Uh, I'm so bad with names, but I know who you mean. Yeah, well, I <laughs> took her position. None of them are there. Yeah, because I, 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 I'm like I'm friends with her from back home. I, sorry, I can't actually remember her name at the moment, but uh, 
Yeah, she uh, she came to me and said, "Look, I'm 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 leaving back for Australia in the next two weeks. Would you possibly want to take over my role for a couple of months?" I said, "Yeah, no worries at all." And then uh, she ended up saying, "You know, I'm not coming back. I'm staying here for for good." So I was here and I just took her job and it kind of just went from there. And right on. Yeah, it just yeah, all fell into place, you know. You know, and sometimes I mean that's that's sort of how I see myself. The way I've landed up in the position I'm at now, you sometimes you just you just gotta just get on a plane and go somewhere, man. <laughs> and you just don't know what'll happen. I mean, you have an objective. I came here to to train. Uh, to train Muay Thai a year ago, but I didn't know how long I was going to stay, and I certainly didn't know where I was going to be a year from now. And here I'm back here, and I'm I'm doing this. So uh, it's just you know it's interesting. I, I think having traveled for like 15 straight months, it's uh, it, it's interesting to see what life will throw at you if you just open some doors. I think a lot of people they get really caught up in everything that they're doing, and um, I don't know. I think this was when I was meditating or something. One of these masters was saying, or I forget what show I saw it on, but you know. When your cup is full, yeah, you basically can't put anything more in the cup. Not and sometimes true. you just have to empty the cup so you can put new stuff in it. And I think, you know, I mean, not everybody has the ability to just leave what they're doing. But, you know, I was unhappy in my career. I was unhappy in my personal life. Yeah, yeah. I was unhappy sort of my, my, my health and et cetera. So I, I went very radical. But um, by emptying the cup, you, you, you can put a whole lot of new stuff in it and it really changes your life forever, you know? Yeah, that's it. It's too many people sit there and they have a dream, you know, and they and they never excel because they're scared of the unknown, I, I'd like to say. Scared yep. of the unknown, scared of not knowing what's going to happen. But, you know, if you want changes in, in your life, you want personal changes, you want results, sometimes you have to open those doors. You have to step outside of that comfortable boundary and, and take the step the next step everybody will tell you that it's all about getting out of your comfort zone yeah you know and it's so funny because it's as simple as doing something like your body fit class like i've been doing it for the last couple days and there's certain exercises like fucking hate burpees you know what i mean and you just don't want to do them it's funny how there's certain exercises but those are the ones that are going to give you the best progress that's it it's the same thing like you know some people just be like i don't like to run so i'm just not going to do that part but it's like you, that's the part that you have to do. That's yeah. the part because if you're not growing, you're dying. You know what I mean? And you're growing when you're doing something outside your comfort zone. Um, so what are your ambitions as a fighter? You haven't fought in a while. How are your injuries going? You you, yeah. you, you get into fighting shape. What's the deal there? Uh, to be honest, after my injuries, I, I got really, really lazy and I've still been lazy. <laughs> so that, that's the dead honest truth. Um, you know, I try and get back into that routine of, of training again full time and um, I just haven't I haven't got back into that routine. I haven't found that that uh, that drive yet. But still fighting in the future is, is where I wanna aim at is what I wanna aim at doing. It just hasn't got me to where I need to at this stage. I just need to need, so to, what do I you need think, to get that uh, back, you know. So there you go. That that moves <laughs> us back to the comfort zone thing. So have you gotten comfy with with the fitness training, or is yeah. there uh, do you do you, I mean, what's it going to take for you to get back? Yeah, to, I mean, to, to, to it's just it. making. I guess it's just making making that step of of again stepping outside of my comfort zone and stop being lazy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know, man. I, two, uh, two big things right there. You know, I trained for uh, basically for three months out here. That's all I did. And then uh, last June, I went to Europe. And then I ended up spending eight months in Europe just living like a Euro pig, man. <laughs> you know, just overeating, over drinking, smoking, not working out. And uh, yeah, I've been back here for, uh, I guess, close to three weeks. And man, it hurts. It's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible how fast you can destroy and how slow it is to build. Yeah, you know. that's extremely true. Very, <laughs> very easy to destroy and very hard to get get everything back. You know. All right, so let's kick things up a notch here, Sam. Did you uh, did you watch the UFC last night? UFC Fight Night sixty one, uh, Bigfoot versus Mir. I seen the last two fights. Um, I I did skip on the the prelims and the start of the main card, but I did get to see the last two fights. Yes. So uh, so co main event was um, Barboza versus Michael Johnson. I uh, on my podcast I did a I did a I always tend to do these um, little previews where I give my predictions, and I, I thought uh, I thought Barboza was going to go. On, I mean he's been on a tear. He's been looking great. Yeah, yeah. And Michael Johnson was out for a year, but he was on a three fight win streak against great talent. I mean he knocked out Galison Tebow. He battered the shit out of Joe Lozon. <laughs> He was he was looking good too, and uh, I predicted that uh, I thought Barboza would have hometown advantage, and I thought he would just just be the fresher fighter. 
but man, he just he couldn't get in his groove. I thought um, I thought Johnson played him perfectly. He got up in his face from the opening bell, yeah, yeah. and just never relented. Yeah, I mean it was still really uh, there was a bit of a back and forth action in there still, um, but like you said, you know he um, he didn't slow down. He was pretty well going for it the whole time. You know it was a it was a really good pace fight. It was a good pace fight for both guys. Yeah, yeah that was crazy because at the end of the day. There was 11 fights on that card, and outside of the first fight, 10 underdogs won in a row. Yeah, that's, that's never happened. Definitely, yeah. That's uh, a new a new uh, record set for the UFC. 10 out of the 11 wins by the underdogs. That's a um, a bit of a, a high rise there. <laughs> and I've heard that some uh, like sports bookies literally got maybe put out of business because of it. Yeah, like because some guys are just. You know, they're just going to bet on all the underdogs, hoping shit happens, and uh, get rich off of it. And uh, reading a few articles online, apparently that's what happened. A bunch of no neighbors just just made a bunch of people rich. But you know what? This is it's, 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 like you said, um, the underdogs. It, this is MMA. It's fifty fifty at in every fight. I agree. You know? I agree. That's anything why anything can change at any time. Listen, I was a stupid idiot once. I've been on a fight once. Shogun versus John Jones. Yeah. I was like, nobody runs through Shogun. Nobody. <laughs> Like, it just doesn't happen, and as spectacular as John Jones has looked, it's not going to happen now. If he might win the fight, but he's not going to destroy the guy. Well, he went out and destroyed the guy. I lost 700 bucks. I've never bet on an MMA <laughs> fight since. But yeah, I mean, that's why we watch the game. That's why I watch the sport. That's why you watch the fight. That's um, it. So I think it's just, it's just, it's the stupidest sport in the world to bet on because, you know, four ounce gloves. Who knows how people are feeling? You got weight cuts. You got people showing up dehydrated. You got some people coming in overweight. You, I mean, it, there's just too many variables, man. Too many ways to win. Too many ways to lose. Yeah, yeah, that's correctly true. So that puts uh, Michael Johnson in a pretty good position. He called out uh, Ben Henderson at the end. Uh, what do you think of Ben Henderson's fight against Thatch? Did you watch that two weeks ago? Yeah, that was a really interesting fight. I think um, obviously a lot of people maybe have overlooked. Henderson in that thinking he's too small um, and Thatch obviously a lot of his fights have been stopped in, I think all, all of them. his fights have been stopped yep. in the first round he was 10 and 1 with 10 stoppages in the first round yeah now once he once he uh, Henderson got out of that first round I knew that he was going to get that fight because again Thatch ha- has not been into deep waters all of his fights have been stopped yep. very early and uh, I think yeah once he got out of that first round I knew Henderson was going to get it just due to the fact of being an ex-champion as well, yep. and um, being in deep waters. Yeah, I was saying on my podcast, you know, I, I've I've had a sort of love-hate relationship with, <laughs> with with Bendo. I thought in the WEC that he was a fantastic fighter, the type of fighter that I like to watch. You know, his fights against Donald Cerrone were incredible. Um, and then he came to the UFC, won the belt, and from there, it just seemed like he was coasting to these controversial decisions. And he seemed very almost arrogant like as the decisions were announced that it was just oh but of course it's me the winner and everybody's yeah, kind of yeah. like you did win dude but you're not making any new fans with this yeah. and uh it was interesting to see how he had that third fight you know two weeks before that fight against that his third fight against Donald Cerrone yeah and I thought he got robbed there I mean I thought there was yeah. no way that they could have given that to Cerrone yeah and you know you saw the look on Hendo's face and everybody's face the ref even Cerrone was just like, dude, sorry, man, I'm not, yeah. I don't, I don't score the fight. You know, it's almost <laughs> like he wanted to just give him the fight if he could have. Yeah. Being the class act that he is. But, uh, so I think we, at that point, I was kind of like, well, there you go, Hendo. That's a little bit of your medicine for you, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. But then when he won this fight, I just became a fan at the end because it was interesting to see him fight his fight. Take the fight away from Thatch. He actually battered him on the feet. I was surprised at how swollen up. I don't know if Thatch just bruises easily or something. Yeah, but yeah. He had, you know, he had two uh, two mouses under his eyes, and uh, it was interesting to see him get down, patiently try to sub him, let that go, got him down the same way, and then and then and sunk it in. So I, I think it was a, you know, Rogan said it, or uh, whoever was it. No, actually, it wasn't. Maybe Rogan commentating. It was uh, John Anik, but uh, and Brian Stan. I like Brian Stan on commentary. Yeah. He's really good. Um, but he said he fought like a champion, and and really, uh, I think that's what I think that's what Benson Henderson did. There, he really fought like a champion, and uh, going up a weight class on, after it's—I mean, that's insane. After a fight with Donald Cerrone that went 15 <laughs> minutes two weeks later, I mean, nobody leaves a Cerrone fight unscathed. I don't care if that that fight sort of looked like a hard sparring match, but yeah, nobody yeah. leaves a fucking Cerrone fight unscathed. I mean, he 
So, I mean, props to him. Yeah, props, props to, to him. You know, Benson Henderson in that fight as well. As I said, once once I thought he made it out of that first round, I thought he was going to have the fight. Even though he looked hurt during second and third round and the first as well, he looked Thatch looked like he was doing a bit of damage, but I knew he was going to slow down. Thatch was going to slow down. And I, I know Henderson's got a, a massive gas tank, and he can go yep. all day yep. if you don't stop him. Obviously. He can keep going and going and going. Agreed. And... Um, yeah, once those later rounds come, I knew that's where obviously Thatch was going to struggle uh, again in deep waters. Yeah. So, what would you like to see uh, Henderson do? Stay at welterweight or drop back down to lightweight? I think he should drop back down. Uh, I th- I just think there's a lot of big fish in that in that division that could potentially cause him a struggling career if he's going to stick there. Yeah, I said that after because uh, on that same card you had Neil Magny who got his sixth straight win. You know, he had he had five victories in a row in 2015. Yeah, yeah. Tying actually Roger Huerta for the the most wins in consecutive fights in a year in the UFC. And uh interestingly enough, the Monday after that they put out the rankings and Magny's still not ranked. So I was like, okay, wait a second. Who's in here? I mean, this guy's on a six-fight win streak at welterweight. You know, who's in there? And it's just, it's a murderer's row. <laughs> you know, the welterweight division hasn't been like this in a long time. Yeah. But it's frightening. You look at the guys who are 15th, 14th. You know, it's guys like Gunnar Nelson and and the Rick Stories and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, there's some serious, you know. And then you got other guys outside of it like uh, Jordan Mean, who just lost to Thiago, Thiago Alves. I don't know if you saw that fight yeah, a few weeks ago. That was a good fight. But that too. dude is talented, man. Yeah. Mean is mean, dude. He was blasting Tiago Alves. I mean, and I, I can't believe he actually lost that fight. Props to Alves. Now they're saying he might fight Carlos Condit. Dude, that's going to be good. Alves Condit? Alves Condit. Yeah. I think Condit's it. got that, yeah. in my opinion. Man, Condit's been out so long, dude. It's been a while. It was a shoulder injury, wasn't it? A dislocated shoulder? Against, uh, no, he jacked his knee up against knee, Tyron knee, Woodley. Yeah, his knee. Tyron yeah. Woodley just on a takedown attempt. And he had Bargered that fight, too. He, he had that fight. I, I thought I thought Condit was actually doing a, doing a really good game plan there against uh, Tyron Woodley. Tyron Woodley's a stud, too, man. Did you see in his last fight there against, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Gasolum. Yeah. Calvin Gasolum. He broke his foot in four places. I don't know if you saw the X-ray. Yeah, of, that's of that I didn't Tyler know. Tyler Woodley's yeah. foot, just every single, yeah, everything except his pinky toe, well, clacked clean, clean in half, like right in the first round. Yeah, that I didn't know actually. I thought, um, obviously, insane, if I would have known that, I would have my opinion would be slightly different. But I think Tyron yep. Woodley's his gas animal, tank. Then. He needs to work on that gas tank. Once he goes past that second round, he's struggling that third round every fight. He he looked leaner. You know, normally he comes in looking like a, almost like a mini Kevin Randleman. Yeah. And like here he was looking, he was, he's looking like he's adapted his muscle better to his frame for MMA. But I like, I like Woodley, man. He's no joke. I would not want to fight the dude, man. Uh, <laughs> and Gaslam's no joke either. Listen, I mean, that was such a classy move by, uh, by Woodley. He literally, you know, he gave him his, his fine back for coming in overweight. And just said, hey, listen, you know, none of you guys, none of us, us guys, like, meaning guys like me, just fans who sit here and criticize, they have no idea what yeah. these guys go through. Just absolutely no idea the, what it takes to get into fighting shape, the injuries you sustain during your training, what it takes to cut weight, what yeah. it takes to rehydrate, and just to show up on that night. You know, it's, it's, it's like the Olympic Games, dude. It's like your fight is tonight at this time. Who knows if your mojo's on or off, you know, so... That's Props to Woodley of, too, man. I mean, he really yeah. showed up classy. I don't always like the guy, but I mean, that night again made me a fan. Yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, a lot of people don't see the behind the scenes stuff. You know, a lot of the fans just see what what's actually happening at that stage. They just see the fight. They just see the performance, but they don't see the deep rooted like the things I have to go through every day. You know, for week weeks weeks on end, seven eight weeks of cutting away, of eating this and eating that, just to try and stay lean and. The mental, the mental makeup that these these fighters have to have to step into inside that octagon in front of everyone once they've been through these these uh, enduring enduring training camps, you know, like it's intense stuff these guys go through. What uh, what do you walk around at weight wise? Um, I'm 84 kilos when I walk around, and uh, as I said before, I drop down to featherweight, so I drop eight from 84 to 66 which is i think so 80. what have you what have you fought at well like welterweight yeah i was at uh welter so originally welter lightweight featherweight uh sorry lightweight well uh lightweight featherweight okay yeah, so 70 70 kg and 66 kg yep right right 
Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting debate. Um, this this weight cutting. I mean, there's just so many debates going on right now in the sport. <laughs> whether it's the you know the, the the PED usage, the weight cutting, the bad refing, the bad judging. I mean, there's so many moving parts in MMA. I think it's. I, I mean, I'm not even really sure it can ever get to the place that people expect it to be because it's just so volatile. You well, know? yeah, I mean, that's the thing. There's always nothing can ever be perfect, right? So. You're always going to have these things that are happening with, with the refs during the fights and these guys that are trying to slip through the cracks with some performance-enhancing drugs. Um, I think there should honestly be like uh, bigger fines on the performance-enhancing drugs. This this is probably the biggest impact that is set in play with the UFC at this stage or with any MMA organization across the world is guys that are you know jacked up on different types of steroids and things like that and... Um, you know, PEDs or whatever they're using, I think this needs to be probably directed uh, as one of the bigger sort of th- things to focus on at the moment. Um, have you, so I don't know if you've looked into what the UFC announced this week. Have you read? So, no, no, okay. I, so if you want to go to, go to trashtalkmma.com, yeah, go yeah. to my website. And I, uh, I found two, I, I read a bunch of articles about it, but I found two. The first one is a, a pretty nice comprehensive and digestible um sort of summary of what the UFC is wanting to put into practice. And then uh, quite interesting, I found an article by um, a combat sports lawyer from uh, British Columbia, Canada, who um, penned, who basically wrote up an article about the, the roadblocks or the potential roadblocks that the UFC is going to face putting these things together. Because, that, I mean, there's some very interesting things like, for example, they can test a fighter any time, but... How do you find the fighter? Like, what if, I, what if you want to test? Like, where physically is he? Yeah. What if he's off in Kazakhstan training? I, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of different things that the UFC is going to have to put into place. To I mean, it's the out of competition testing here yeah. that becomes yeah. interesting. They vowed to test every single competitor on the night of, and then they vowed to test, I believe, every single main event tester and perhaps co-main event, if I remember correctly. Outside of competition. Yeah, yeah. And it's all just randomly whenever they want. But I mean, there's a lot of logistics involved with that. Anyway, I don't want to get too deep on this because it's something that we're going to talk about a lot with John yeah. Priest. But uh, yeah, there's just, there's a, there's a lot of dynamics going on. And it's interesting because as this year started and I sort of looked at where the UFC is and you look at the plethora of events they're cranking out. I mean, there's literally a fight every single week now. The cards are littered with no name fighters and, and no disrespect to them. But I mean, that, that's the bottom line. It's like, I've been pointing this out. I'm sort of making it a routine practice to whenever I get one of these uh, non-pay-per-view cards to, to look at the card on, on Wikipedia. Yeah. And quite simply, you can see how many relevant fighters or not are on there because there's a whole bunch of dudes that don't even have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> like I, you as a fighter, do you have a Wikipedia? No. Exactly. You know what I mean? You're still a professional fighter. Yeah. You have a record and there is a, there is a, there's a history there. There's, there's a, I mean, how do you keep track of your fights? Like, how, is there like some sort of database tracking it's in Australia Sherdog. for your fights? I think Sherdog's just uh, the the tracking device for anyone really at this stage. Yeah. Um, that's all I've ever used. That's all I've ever um, seen my record on is just Sherdog. Yeah. Now, does it does it appear there out of your initiative or does it just appear there after you've done a fight? Um, you know what? I think a lot of fights actually don't show up on Sherdog. I think a lot of people are missing... Missing well, fights imagine. that have been I mean, on I mean, there. It and, must be yeah. almost impossible to do. Like, there's there's so many fights now. Yeah, I mean, well, that's it's it. It's crazy. There's fights all across the world, like, all in the every time. country. I mean, let's not even talk about, like, Muay Thai fights in Thailand, where yeah. they're just, every single night, you can see guys competing for, for, for peanuts yeah. and getting blasted. And, I mean, I, that's that's a whole other talk, too, as well, that you'll have <laughs> on another day, because... I've been going with fighters. You know, I went. I went with Marcel to to his last fight down in uh, Marcel Gaines is a is a South African fighter who's uh, fighting for Tiger Muay Thai, a really good guy. And um, I mean, it's just it's just wild. You go to these events and it's just everybody walks in the front door. Everybody leaves out to the front door. The guys are showing up. They don't even know who they're going to fight until maybe fifteen or twenty minutes before the fight. They're getting their hands wrapped. With no supervision whatsoever, beside a bunch of beside their opponent, I mean, it's it's hilarious, and yet at the same time, there's such a, a rawness and a, an honor system to it. There has to be, you yeah. Know I mean, yeah. there has to be, you know, because literally, guys could be slipping rolls of quarters into their fucking wraps. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> but nobody does it. Everybody can wrap their hands however they want. Nobody inspects that. And guys go out and they just put on a show. You know, I mean, there's, there's a certain, you know, there's a certain purity to it. Yeah. You know? I mean, that's, it's, it's funny that because this is how amateur boxing in Australia actually is at this stage. There's a lot of just this rawness and, it's a good thing. It's not a. It's not a bad thing. It's it's built. It builds character for these fighters. You know, like these these guys are going. Like you said, they're going in there for competing for peanuts. This is the, these guys are fighting f- with their heart. You know, they're not fighting for a paycheck and this and that. So I think this is this separates guys from just wanting to fight for money and just wanting to fight. You know, for the for the reason of fighting and com- competition. Um, obviously, this brings out competition in people and makes them test themselves in so many different ways. Yeah, I mean, and that's a great point. Uh, everybody that I've met here that I've that I've talked to and trained with, uh, I mean, they're all doing this out of a love for the sport. Yeah. Like, they're just put on earth to do this. So it's funny, man, because, it, you know, everything's becoming big business, uh, you know, in particular the UFC. And it's funny how, how Thai boxing just remains this, you know, kind of this sport that's on this, <laughs> in this country. I mean, it's practiced obviously elsewhere, but... You know, it, it's the national sport here, yeah, right? It's very traditional here. You know, they like to stick with the traditional. You know, everybody, time. you know, kids in America, they're going to learn how to throw a baseball when they turn three, four years old. Well, here they, they're throwing head kicks. <laughs> kids, literally, I have footage that I'll be uploading to YouTube of seven and eight year old girls literally getting TKO'd, yeah. you know, in, in fights. And, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you come from a certain background, uh, you know, with a certain minimal education and you look at that and you're like, these are children getting concussed, getting taking, you know, taking liver kicks, getting dropped flat, you know, face planting. And you're like, you know, it's a, it's crazy, it's man. A different type of lifestyle. Idea. Definitely. That's, you know, that's something that I've really brought away from my travels too, is there is no such thing as normal, man. <laughs> There's just what happens wherever you are. You know, That's and, correct. you know, people here, you know, I show up here as a Canadian and I'll go to these fights. I'll be like, what the fuck? These these kids are they're, they're Absolutely They don't even have their, their their adult teeth in yet. And they're they're throwing bombs on each other. Yeah. You know, it's like technique, crazy it's technique, mental. power. You see girls doing it. That was the first time I didn't realize chicks were doing it. <laughs> and I was down at Patong Stadium and I was like, whoa, there was like two or three chick fights, man. I hadn't seen that. So. But that's that's normal here. That's what people do. That's what these these kids, their fathers train this stuff. They're trainers. They're champions. And wait they to just, wait. And they just yep. Yeah. yeah. From their youngest age, they're in they're they're in the ring, you know, throwing bombs. It's crazy, man. And you got to wonder. I mean, the guys are 15 years old and they've had what probably 150 fights. Yeah. 200 some of these, fights. Some of these guys are like anywhere between like 100 to four 500 fights. It is mental. The the amount of experience and the amount of exposure to the local scene of the Muay Thai here is absolutely crazy. And these guys, again, as you said before, these guys go in there and they fight for peanuts. They fight for next to nothing. And it's mental. It's mental. Every show you go to, you see these crazy, crazy fights with the kids, the, the adults still, you know, three, four hundred fights experienced between them. Mental. Crazy. So it's still the start of the year, Sam. What's, uh, what are your goals for 2015? You want to get you want to you're going to try to find that mojo to get back in, into fighting shape. Definitely going to have to get that mojo back. I definitely want to get get back in here and maybe get three, four fights out for the year. Um, again, got to grab that mojo. <laughs> All right, man. We'll we'll have to watch Austin Powers after. <laughs> so, um, how can people keep in touch with you? What, uh, what what's your presence on social media? How do you like to uh, how do you like people to, to follow you? Get in touch with you. Yep. So the name Sam Baston. Um, got Facebook. Instagram, you can find me at Sam underscore Baston. Um, also have my website, www.sambaston.com. Uh, got a couple of things running, so I mean, check them all out and uh, send me a message. Uh, you got any questions, fire, fire some messages at me, questions at me, all good. Do you do uh, personal training at uh, Tiger Muay Thai? Yes, I'm a personal trainer as well as a, the fitness instructor there as well. Um, so if you're ever at, at Tiger Muay Thai, you're ever in Thailand, Phuket, come and see me. We can get involved with some. Do you have a particular? Training. Do you have a particular style, or do you have a particular type of uh, of training package that that people might, you know, find find more interesting to get through you than through somebody else? I mean, basically, do you have a sped? Do you have an angle? Uh, my angle, I, I like to work with absolutely anyone, you know, if anyone's serious about their training and they want to commit to a change in lifestyle, that's, that's my commitment to, to help them with their, with their goals. Yeah. So absolutely anything you need to work on, I'm that person. 
Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure, Sam. Thanks for coming out. Just so everybody knows, his name is spelled Sam, S-A-M, Bastin. It's B-A-S-T-I-N. Sam, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Antoine Pelletje, host of the Trash Talk MMA podcast. You guys know where to find me, trashtalkmma.com. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Blueberry. I'm all over the place. And uh, yeah, hit me up, man. Hit me up on Facebook. Hit me up on Twitter. And uh, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and give me a five-star rating if you like it. That allows me to reach a lot more fans and, uh, and spread the message. All right, everybody. Peace. Thanks for listening to the Trash Talk MMA podcast. Be sure to visit TrashTalkMMA.com. And don't forget to follow Antoine on Twitter at Trash Talk MMA. Let us know you're listening. Use hashtag Trash Talk MMA. And uh, 12 professional MMA. All right. Yeah. Shit. I mean, 12 fights is already pretty good. Yeah. It's <laughs> For 23. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, how how did you fare? What's the record at? Yeah, I'm six and six as a pro. Okay. Um, I hold uh, an Australian title, Combat Eight, uh, which I took out with my last fight. I dropped uh, dropped a featherweight for the first time in my career. Okay. Uh, I dropped from 84 kilos down to 66 kilos, which is a a very very big drop for for anyone to handle. Um, but now that's my new that's my new weight class at featherweight, um, which I prefer. But again, yeah, six and six as a pro, but always looking to to get into fights, uh, I haven't I haven't competed in in a year and a half. Has had a bit of a layoff due to some injuries and things like that. But what were the injuries? Uh, I broke my my hand three times in 2013 and once in 2014. All during fights? Uh, twice during fights. Yeah, and twice during sparring. What were you throwing? Uh, left jab, left hook. Yeah. Shit! So you broke your hand on a jab? Yes, Damn. in a fight. <laughs> that must be a good jab. <laughs> That's crazy, man. So obviously, you're now here in Thailand. You're 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 a trainer at Thailand. Welcome to Trash Talk MMA, the number one podcast for news and insight that matters in the world of mixed martial arts. Brought to you live and unfiltered from all four corners of the globe by MMA aficionado Antoine Peltier. Yo. Welcome to the Trash Talk MMA Podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Peltier, and on today's episode, I have a very special guest, Mr. Sam Bastin, fitness instructor at Tiger Muay Thai. Sam, how you doing? Yeah, good. I'm glad to be here, and uh, I've never done one of these podcasts before, so it's uh, something interesting and new for me. As Antoine said, uh, I'm a fitness instructor at Tiger Muay Thai. I'm also a professional MMA fighter from Australia, uh, Australia, Port Macquarie, New South Wales, I've been here now in Thailand for a year, uh, just under a year, sorry, about, you know, 10, 11 months, and um, I moved everything I have from home to here to better myself with my MMA career and also uh, with my job now at Tiger Muay Thai as a fitness coach. Great. So listen, before we get into what you're doing currently at Tiger Muay Thai, I'd like to just get into your background. You said you're a professional MMA fighter. What got you into martial arts and at what age? Uh, I started uh, martial arts at a very young age. I first start, found Kung Fu when I was about six, seven years old. Uh, my parents got me into that as I was actually getting bullied at school, so it kind of went a funny way. Uh, once I started learning how to defend myself and um, sticking up for myself, you know, a couple of years in from learning Kung Fu towards then towards boxing, uh, and I started actually competing at an amateur level when I was 14 years old sure. uh, okay. with boxing. Uh, yeah. I've now been doing that for a, a number of years as well taking away a couple of state titles and regional titles and things like that. So you started your career in combat sports in boxing, with amateur boxing? Yes, with amateur okay. boxing, 14 right. years old, yeah. So from there, uh, what, what? where did you go after the boxing? What was the next martial art that you... Yeah, um, as soon as I uh, finished high school, I actually moved away to Port Macquarie, and uh, that's where I found mm. uh, another another local gym there, um, which which uh, taught MMA and other combat sports as well. So I... I uh, Pretty much got into that straight away, the MMA, the MMA scene, and then four weeks in, I had my very first amateur MMA fight. Yeah. Shit. Okay. Yeah. So. Now, were you always a UFC fan? Like, what was your exposure to mixed martial arts? Um, exposure to mixed martial arts, I, I watched some local shows, some local Australian shows, CFC, um, Brace, things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, these shows have been around for a while. And uh, some some guys interested me on there, like uh, Jai Bradney, 
to name one of them, uh, Jason Harris, my my uh, previous trainer. Um, so I had you know some some prior knowledge to MMA, but had never pursued anything serious until I actually moved to Port Macquarie, where I first began MMA. Yeah. So that was at what age? The MMA. Eighteen. I had my first amateur fight when I was eighteen years old. And how old are you now? Uh, I'm twenty three now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So how many fights have you had? Um, I've had 30 fights altogether, 19, uh, 18 amateur, uh, amateur boxing, one amateur MMA. Tiger Muay Thai. What, uh, what, how did the decision come about for you to leave Australia and to, and to come out here? You know, I wanted some, uh, some new changes. I kind of was in a position back home where I thought I needed to make a, a change. Otherwise I was just going to continue on the same path I was, I was at. And that was not really getting the exposure that it, I, I could have potentially had. So that's why I chose to come to Tiger Muay Thai. Um, I seen their advertisements all, all across Facebook, all across the internet. And well, and there's so many Australians yeah. here. I mean, you it's, know, crazy, it's crazy. You know? For anybody who's never been out here, I mean, you come out to Phuket and there's, there's Australians and Russians. <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting to see that. Uh, see, I don't think that there's such a big exposure. For example, you know, I'm from Canada. And I spent the last uh, well, the last year traveling, but before that, I spent six years in Los Angeles, and I never really heard of Tiger Muay Thai, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's and it. Uh, I'm sure they probably want to change that. And uh, I think now the fact that you're actually getting Tiger Muay Thai fighters in the UFC, that's going to bring a lot of exposure to what's already going on here, which is basically one of, if 